Okay. Cool. All right. So uh, glad to see everybody. Uh, I haven't been to Barkham for like five years, so it's good, glad to be back. Uh, just before I start the proper proper, just want to find out who where, who who are among you guys fly drones, um, own one, sell one. <laughs> So, so this couple of you have touched the drone before. So it's been a hot topic for a few years now. I, I'm, I'm really glad that now it's like it's mainstream and has died down. <laughs> but there's a lot of things that's happened uh, in the last few years. Uh, and I thought today I'm going to summarize what's happened in um, a discussion on air traffic control. Because uh, the, main, the main issue that we're going to face uh, in the coming years is the safety. It's the same, similar to bicycling, but now you have these things zooming not along, along the roads, but zooming in the sky. What can we do about it? What's the government doing about it, and how can we all contribute to that? All right. So I'm going to sit down here, and we are going to first go through uh, some slides, so I can show you some some stuff, and after that we can have a discussion in the last 15, 10 minutes. All right. Can you all see? Is it very? <laughs> I'm so sorry. It's Google Maps. So basically, yeah. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Don't worry. Yeah. I'll just talk through this. No, so. Basically today, um, if you're flying drones, I, I don't know that you're flying drones, right? Your drones don't broadcast and don't tell basically anybody where you are, except the, basically the pilot, right? We, what we do know today um, in, in the drone world is kind of like where you shouldn't be flying, right? So this is a sample, sample from a, an app we built where we took all the, the no-fly zones and we put all the no-fly zones on the map properly. Um, a lot of the no-fly zones that have been published by, say, the uh, US authorities uh, or some global authorities are not that accurate. So this is accurate to CAS laws, right? So as you can see, if, if we know that there's a large part of Singapore that's not really um, uh, is outside the no-fly zone, so you could be flying anywhere, right? But uh, a lot of people actually don't know exactly where the, the, the no-fly zones are. So I'm going to zoom into the middle yellow circle. That's basically what we call the um, orchard no-fly zone. Uh, if you zoom in, if you use our tool, you can find out that it's just special use airspace. It's restricted. You're not supposed to be flying in Orchard Road. What's yes? the difference between the red and the red? Okay, the, that, that, that uh, color changes uh, depending on uh, if it's um, like no-no or like maybe you have to call them to confirm the kind of thing yeah so at different times of the day for different periods of time the colors will change yeah. this, this, what is that? You that about 400 feet or a bit long, yeah, we're talking about drones now so maybe to give a bit more uh, uh, context right so we're not talking about the, the planes the man aircraft this is basically the, um, uh, there's a huge industry that's being created now both from the hobby side of things people just flying taking pictures uh, taking wedding photos as well as the commercial guys right um, which is basically where my company is what we're doing right now we are we're inspecting buildings inspecting uh, trees uh, flying over for agriculture for telcos for utility companies etc right so most of our job is being done in within um, in Singapore, it's actually within 60 meters. Uh, in other countries like Malaysia, and Indonesia, it's about 120 meters, so 400 feet is basically that that limit. Yeah. So um, maybe if you are familiar with the man aircraft uh, terminology, is basically the um, what they call class B airspace. Yeah. Not the class B C E. And all, and all these these things that are marked out are basically the, the sort of the no fly zones. Those are the sort of airport uh, areas where you're supposed to f stay in Singapore's law five kilometers away from the boundaries of the airport. Right. So you can, you can see, like, this is Changi, right? So five kilometers from here, this is Pai Lebar, five km from here, you're not supposed to be flying uh, around here. Right? But there are also other, other uh, restrictions be, uh, based on different use cases. I, I, can, I can go through the tool later, since Singtel gave free data today, so we'll, we, can, we can log in and, and download stuff. Now, I just want to zoom into the yellow circle. As you can see, National Gallery is here. We're actually in the no-fly zone for Orchard, <laughs> including Padang. <laughs> Uh, there's a bunch of heritage trees here. I, I also flag those things out like heritage trees and national parks because apparently your insurance goes up if you're flying close to those things. Um, <laughs> but you can fly in Esplanade, <laughs> just across the street. <laughs> say, say it again. This is not mentioned on Casa's website. They do, they do. Yeah. They, yes, precisely. They, they actually do say that, but they say it in a very, very unclear manner because they, they publish basically a, a JPEG file. Okay, it's, a, it's a nice picture. Uh, yeah, again, I can, I can put it up. Maybe I'll put it up after the, after the deck, okay? So what's, what's the difference between the red and the yellow? What are the actual differences in the images? Like, uh, like I was clarifying, the color, color code is a, it's a, it's a, it's, it's, it's a color that we gave on the tool based on the proximity of you to the 
uh, polygon, as well as whether there is some uh, events happening that day. For example, right, if, if, if F1 was happening right now, this whole place would be red. Right? So, but F1 is not happening now. You could fly in Orchard if CAS give you uh, permits to do that. So you're right? you, yeah. that uh, you can't operate under the... Yes, yes. You, you need to get permit. Okay, so I'll come to that later. Maybe what we do is we go through the, we go through the deck. Um, basically, it's exactly to address your problem, right? Because today what happens is you come out to Padang, you, you bring our nice drone, the, the Mavic that you just bought, right? And you fly, you quickly fly, you quickly come down, and then you vanish, right? <laughs> Nobody knows, right? So what, what would... What, what, what will happen, right? People will stare at you and then they'll say, oh, look, look, the bird is there flying, then they just walk off, right? So basically nobody cares except the government. <laughs> right? Right now, nobody really, really cares about the government until some things happen, right? So in, this, in, in Malaysia, when we were flying, sometimes people walk past and say, hey, stop flying here. Last week, somebody crashed a drone and killed my son or something like that. Right? And that happens, that happens. And if you read the news, you go to I mean, a country big enough like US, every day some, some kind of mish mishap has happened. Right? And they, these guys have a big problem. Singapore is a very small and dense place. And they really want to fly, find out what, where every single thing that leaves the ground is. Right? They kind of want to know, because to them, their jurisdiction is anything that flies. <laughs> right? so, <laughs> they already know where all the planes are. Okay, so you're familiar with this tool called Flight Radar 24, and there are a bunch of other similar sites. How do they get this information? It's because all the planes volunteer their position, right? There's a, there's a technology basically around there, I'll come to that, right? They volunteer the information, right? And they want to know drones. So they basically want something like this, right? Where if you're flying close to Changi Airport, right, they should be flagged out because you are kind of in the aerodrome, right? Uh, and you're not supposed to be doing that. So, they're still quite far from it. So today what they do to us, because we are we're kind of like the uh, guys with the operator permit when we fly, is that they, they, they require us to apply for an activity permit. So there's a two-tier permit scheme. First, you become an operator. They test you. This is like a kind of a uh, exam, the same exam you go through when you're driving a car. Right? So you get the permit that you know how to fly the drone. The drone is airworthy. And they tell a whole bunch of things you, don't, you should not be doing. If you do that, you must let us know in advance. Every time we fly, we get an activity permit. And five minutes before we fly, we have to call air traffic control, right? So um, yeah, so we know two or three squadron very well because every time we go to work, <laughs> it'll be two squadron. We're taking off five minutes. Okay, you're clear to fly. There's no other, you know, random aircraft coming in. You have the airspace till this time. And after that, you have to call them back. Okay, we've landed. Airspace back to you. So they're basically dealing with us just like how they deal with man aircraft, right? And it's completely manual. It's really phone calls, right? Each, uh, yes, yeah. So it is. Uh, so each non-recreational drone, drone flight. So if you're just flying recreationally, you don't talk to yes, them. But each, each flight, yes. So each, uh, it could be uh, multiple flights grouped together as one. We, they call it an activity. So let's say we, we take a half an hour or one hour slot. We can do maybe three. Like maybe you're flying not so high, then you don't need to call. It is all purpose driven. It doesn't matter what altitude you fly. So your purpose is for work kind of thing, right? So let's say you volunteer to fly for your wedding photographer for taking proper wedding shots for, for money or something, right? So that is kind of like a job. So that's something that you need to apply for a permit, right? But if you just bought a drone, just fly in, uh, in an open field, that's okay. That's okay. So yeah. How do you uh, we've asked them the question before. <laughs> <laughs> so because originally we thought it was money. But it's not. It's, it's purpose driven. So if you're doing for work, even if you don't receive a cent, it's for work. You kind of have to apply. Research has its own category. So if you're part of a school doing research on drones, you have a separate category. You can apply for that. Yeah. 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 So. <laughs> so for us, it's actually we don't mind, right? Because by doing that, what it means is that Singapore in general is safer. Because then we do know where all these drones are flying, and especially the ones who are doing for work is usually the more dangerous flights because you're usually flying over, say, um, like we sometimes fly in Tuas, in, in Jurong Island, those places where, you know, petrochemical <laughs> and all these things. You want to kind of know, like, the, the drones that's flying there are safe, right? But what we want to do is, can we do this automatically, right? Without having to call them and have, have to all these things set up, right? So let's go back to the planes. So how planes do it today is through this technology called ADSB. Uh, again, it's too small. It's automatic dependent surveillance dash broadcast. It's a, it's a, it's a, 
I thought it was old, but apparently it's pretty new. Right? Um, in, until the maybe early, early of this century, it's still all radar. So basically, the, these guys, the 23 Squadron, Changi Airport, ATC, etc., they're just using primary radar to look out for planes. Right? Uh, everything then else is directly comes with the, the, the plane, uh, the, sorry, the pilot of the, the MN aircraft. But ADSB has changed all that. So from uh, 2013 onwards, uh, basically all of the Singapore FRR is required. So you fly basically to, you know Singapore actually manages a much larger airspace than, than Singapore, right? So everyone who is in, uh, flying through Singapore FRR must use ADSB from 2013 onwards, right? And, and that's great because now uh, there's an automatic way for the plane to broadcast and all the ATCs will know where each manned aircraft is, okay? Okay, when I use manned aircraft, the, the official definition for CAS is anything above 7 kg. Wow. So if you are, even if you are a drone, like you are the, the, the drones that the US sent to Afghanistan, the, the, the ball, the ball, okay, those are considered under the manned aircraft kind of category, right? So they, they have a different set of rules to qualify and, and, and things like that. So for below 7 kg, we have a separate set of rules. In some countries, it goes up to 25 kg, but usually it's, it's a weight-driven thing. Um, on the opposite end, in US right now, the FAA has just passed the law just a month or two ago where everything above 250 grams requires registration. <laughs> okay, so now, now if you buy a Phantom, if you are familiar with the, the, the drone scene, right? If you buy a Phantom or you buy anything, right? You fly in US, you must register with FAA, even if you fly recreationally. Yeah. So they usually go by weight class. Balloons. balloons are different. <laughs> so the Caribbean goes by like uh, rotors, fixed wing, and then uh, balloons have its own thing. Singapore is the same thing. So Sing Singapore has, I think, kites is a separate thing. Right? <laughs> yes, yes. So the picture you saw just now from the Padang is actually from a kite. <laughs> it's not from a drone because you're not supposed to fly the drone. Well, to attach a motor to a kite, huh? make it a drone. No. <laughs> it's how you fly. It's yeah, airworthiness. The yeah. The, the kite, the good thing about kite is because it's teetered. You always have that so string to it. We have actually asked that question to CES before. Oh, Not yet, know. but they are considering it. Oh, the they have considered because there's a large part of Singapore that we couldn't fly drones in, right? And because of that, they're thinking maybe the way to go is teetered drones. So in the latest uh, master service contract that is awarded, um, half the jobs are given to teetered drones, half the jobs are given to unteetered drones. And they are trying to experiment to see which one is better. Because the, the concept of teetered drones is not just that uh, it's teetered. It's entirely powered from the ground. Yeah. Right? So the moment any part of the wire is cut, the drone will just fall like a brick. And that moment, this becomes a drone. <laughs> and that moment, it becomes a brick. <laughs> and that moment, it becomes a brick. <laughs> Okay, so back to this. So what, what is what's interesting about ADSB is that actually it, it is kind of its own system, right? You have your own ground system that you can just receive the broadcast from the, from the sky. Um, it, it doesn't work very well with drones because we, we're actually too low, so the receivers are actually not, not, not in the range. What we are in range actually is LT, 4G LTE, right? So a lot of the guys are actually figuring out how to connect all the drones through our typical uh, telco stuff. So we're also working on something like that, so, uh, but we haven't really went public with it yet, so I'm showing you what other people in the world has done. So AT&T, Intel, Verizon uh, has said that they have tried to connect with drones already. Uh, Nokia is doing something in the Middle East, right, where they, they are doing traffic monitoring, but the same concept is the drone will be, will be broadcasting and controlled directly through telco network. Do you look at Sigfox? Yeah. Uh, no, don't have the range. You don't have the range and the power, yeah. So, so IoT technologies usually goes two ways. There's, there's one that kind of like this kind of uh, environment and ubiquitous kind of thing. Uh, Sigfox falls into that kind of kind of thing. Uh, for drones, you can It's hard to project a beam 60 meters into the sky, and stay connected, right? So, in fact, today, in fact, you you want to talk about 4G LTE in Singapore, it doesn't really work. It works in some of the countries like Malaysia, Indonesia, because most of our antennas are pointing at the ground. The moment you bring a, yeah, you put a dongle on a drone or something, you fly about, say, 20 meters, it's silent. Oh. Yeah, it's really silent. It's really peaceful in the, in the sky. <laughs> no, not, no, no, no surfing on Facebook in the sky. Okay, so, and, but because we operate typically 40 to 60 meters in, the, in, in, in Singapore, so it's completely silent right now with, with us, um, you know, who, who wants to build a network that points at the sky? There's kind of hardly any demand. <laughs> So it's two ways. Uh, we, work out so we are working on something, and then hopefully we'll share with you guys uh, maybe yeah, in the next market. market. 
Huh? Yeah, yes, there, there are people building uh, 4G LTE networks that, uh, that goes the other way, right? Not, not this way to the ground. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so what, what's happening is this, right? And that's why I want to have a kind of a discussion with you guys, is what we have built so far as a company is that we, we have already kind of a drone fleet management system. We, we track our drones through it, exactly this technology. So 4G LTE, um, we know where our drones are. We can put them on a map. But to go from this step to this, the original goal we talked about just now, which is to have an air traffic control automatically say, OK, you should not be applying this airspace because someone is coming to you, right? There's a lot of things that need to happen. Right? And the main two things that uh, we're discussing is, firstly, there's no protocol, right? Because we, we can't use our own, our own protocol. And of course, there's no regulations, right? So um, in terms of protocol, what's happening in the world right now is there's a whole bunch of people trying to come up with protocols. One of the earliest ones turns out to be NASA, right? <laughs> I, I don't know why they want to come to the drone space, but well, uh, there's a professor called Kopateka uh, in NASA. He has been like a proponent for UTM, UAS Traffic Management Systems, and he's been writing papers for the last five years about how we could manage basically uh, uh, an, a manned aircraft uh, space as well as the uh, drone space, which is kind of like separated by in, okay, this US slide, so 500 feet, 200 feet. Right? Google is trying to do the same thing. They have their own protocol, and they're trying to figure out how we can become airspace providers. And, and it's very API-driven, and looks exactly like how, how everything else that Google comes up with looks like. Right? So they bought, they bought project. They have this project wing, if you know, you guys know about it. They bought a company called Skycatch, Skycatch as well. And now they're trying to come up with an airspace service. And, and there are many other bodies that, that's jumping in. Right? So um, the, the good thing about Singapore is we are kind of a test bait, right? So we, we, can, we, we have very good relationships with CAS. And if we can, we can propose something right, uh, for the CAS, we could sort of um, maybe become the first one in the world to have a fully functional uh, air traffic control for drones. Right? So until that, uh, until that comes, um, it, it's kind of anyone's game. Right? So anybody can, can propose something and build something as long as the, the, the players in Singapore are all willing to kind of comply with that protocol. And then together, we go to the, the, the government and say, hey, you can regulate us this way. Right? Um, they might, they might actually pick it up and say, let's, say, let's, let's do it this way. Right? So uh, I, I would like to hear, I, I don't have any more slides. So I just wanted to hear and have a small discussion with you guys, like what you guys have uh, concerns. So I think just now you, we have uh, some questions about man aircraft and uh, US. Okay, I'm happy to have that discussion. But also as a regular citizen of, this, of, the, of space, right? Uh, if, if drones becomes a really common thing, as common as bicycles, tomorrow, right? How do you think that this whole, reg this, this whole space should be regulated? And how, how do you think that we should kind of let you know that we are coming to you? Um, you know, should, we, should we all be broadcasting ADSB and should all our phones have a ADSB receiver and, 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 and beeps and say, look out, there's a drone above you? <laughs> is that, is that, is, should that be the case? Because that's kind of like the, what, what Google is pro proposing, right? Every drone has a receiver. As, as long as a man aircraft comes by, the drones will figure out that there's a man aircraft coming. They will ultimately go to the side or come down or go away until the man aircraft leaves. What is the problem that Google is trying to solve by having this system? So there's, there's uh, that they are, oh, I got the wrong picture. Ah, I got the wrong picture. Anyway, so the, the problem they are trying to solve is, is twofold, right? There's one, on one level, you want data aggregated at the center. So some way of collecting those data and appearing in some big dashboard. That, that big dashboard could be shared with the public, could be only private to the ATC, doesn't matter, right? So that is the kind of like the data going through to the cloud kind of, of right? Uh, uh, many reasons. So um, if something happens, you kind of have an audit trail, right? Uh, insurance company wants to know what happened. Um, management, right? You, when something is coming, before it actually becomes a problem, you want to be able to call the pilot and say, hey, get out of the way. Right, that kind of thing. So, so from a central command and control perspective, you want to know where everyone is uh, to do that. Right. The other way to solve the problem is kind of a peer-to-peer -peer kind of uh, way to do it, which is kind of how we solve our own problem the, on, on the road. Right. We don't we don't call somebody and say, hey, somebody's blocking blocking the road. <laughs> right. We just push our horn. Right. And say, get out of the way. Right. So the same the same idea. The, between the drones, they, they they are trying to set up some form of communication and say, hey, I'm here. Right? I'm quite close to you. This is my GPS location. This is your GPS location. Maybe we should hit, both head the opposite direction so that we don't end up clashing on each other. It's 
It right. seems like in Singapore, these two problems are non problems then because, mm -hmm. because un unless I'm wrong, I don't think drones are going to collide that frequently. It's oh, like not, <coughs> not yet. Not now, now, yes. But not, not, but it's not the, just drone yeah. collision, but yeah. also frequency collision. Frequency collision, yeah, that, that has already happened. <laughs> The drones, those most of most of the drones today are fly with uh, flown with your two point fours and basically your Wi Fi range, right? So, yeah. Is there a projection in Singapore of the number of drones that are going to be flying in the sky in the next ten years, and it shows that it's going to be a major problem? So that we need to regulate and start to think about it right now. Yes. In our last conversation, CAS, they think so, right? Um, we we don't think so in that uh, because most of the things that we like, for example, we get a job. We have to inspect certain buildings. So that, that whole area is kind of ours, so we can manage ourselves. So if we're flying three drones at once, we can manage ourselves, right, the three drones. Right? The problem comes when we have different owners and different, different actors. Right? So in an in a open field, like if you all are familiar with Old, Old Holland Road, right, this is where most of the hobbies are flying today. Um, if it's a Sunday afternoon and then 20 people showed up, uh, today it's kind of like, hey, he's flying, I'm just going to wait. He's going to come down, it's my turn. <laughs> But if it comes to the stage where everyone's flying all the time, then what do you do, right? Do you, do you just like, like how kites are in Barrage? In Marina Bay and yeah. flying kites, you can see that. Yes, precisely. Yes. Is so high yes. The yeah. So I, I don't know. So do we leave it that, that we could, we can leave it that way, right? Yeah. <coughs> yes. It's quite a different area that's relevant. You take the kites and the and that's the experience. You can't, you won't get that experience inside, inside one year, but over time, if you've got a solid uh, ATC system for drones, you are then in a position to integrate with Singapore's air traffic control and to gain controlled access to some of the space that's currently reserved as aerodromes. That space is necessarily conservative. You've got to look at a huge current in both directions yes. to cover every possible emergency that could arise. In fact, 99.9% of that airspace is disused the whole time. So it, once you've got a solid ATC system for drones, solid meaning reliable and digital fighting modes, yeah. you're in a position to negotiate access to some of that space that's currently <coughs> sort of clumsily allocated to drones. So that's 20% of Singapore's airspace. So that's quite a large area where drones can't be used for building inspections for any of those aerial functions. Yes. That would become at least possible with principle once a solid ATC so there's a real, there's real value there, I'm uh, Where I'm coming from is this, from a product point of view, there doesn't seem to be this huge need now, and if we have all this regulation over it, it might just kill it, you okay. see? So it's kind of like... No, it's, a, it's a fair point, it's a fair point. So there's always the worry that you do something that's too early, right? Um, it's come up for me because, um, maybe because we are in that position to have that conversation, right? And, and we have always, always asked this question, right? What happens? Do you have object collision avoidance? No one has a collision avoidance with another drone. Because it's, it's hardly, you, you can hardly detect it. It's always moving. It's so small. Right? So it's hard to do that on a, on a, on a sensor basis. So you kind of have to do it from a broadcast of position basis. So whether that position is broadcast to the, uh, the other drone on a field on field basis, <coughs> or does it go to some central command and then decides, hey, both of you are in the same space? What we should be alerted that you're in the same space. Okay. Do you also have operational interest? Is it where is moving towards? Uh, should we want to be able to automate merge operations? Is the need yeah. to be so we, we want to do that, but you see, um, again, there are two things, right? So one part is, is kind of a CAS has to do uh, nationwide, or rather, like, for every kind of thing. And there's the other thing, which is kind of like, if you want to participate in this thing, we can do it. Day, right? So we build our APIs and stuff so we can integrate our new drones easily as well. But it only covers the, the few models of drones that are as well as the ones that we build ourselves. Right? I get that. I'm sort of taking the Thomas's question about where is the problem to solve? Uh -huh. you've, got, you've currently got an operational efficiency that you've got to have a human being mm -hmm. speak to yes. uh, sort of a control organization. Presumably, uh, your business runs better if you don't have to do that. Mm -hmm. Is that a reasonable it, claim or is that not true? Yes. Well, but, but less so for our human efficiency proper thing because the, the human is always going to be there anyway. Uh, the, the law still requires uh, the, the pilot to be looking at the drone. So there's always going to be a pilot just whether he makes the call or he focuses on his flight 
and of all this information is anyway captured. So it's, it's automated versus manual thing. Until that time, and, and this is being discussed right now in countries like Australia, right? Uh, BVLOS uh, beyond mutual outside flights is uh, crit is critical. It's, the place is too heavy, right? So there are a lot of drones actually flying in the middle of nowhere. Uh, then you really, really need to have this ATC because you really need to know where other drones are. Because you can't just go to the sky and say hi. Can you fly first, then I fly. You can do that. Right? So yes. So for for those cases, yes. But for Singapore, we need the person to be there. That's all. all right. Any other things? I mean, we, I mean, we can take this off now. How do you deal with the standardization of the drones? The, the manufacturers, you know, they all have a slightly different system. Yes. Would there be a standardization? It, it, it is, in fact, the, the, the reason why we want to do it. Because if, if there was only one drone, I think that the company would own that problem and take care and do it themselves, right? The, the precisely the problem, the uh, vast majority of hobbies are flying, like, say, DJIs. Those are the known ones, right? Now. But, the vast majority of the people who are doing the kind of what call commercial drones or working drones, right? they, they customize their own thing. So, so you take my one, my drones for example, although the flight controller is a, a lot of the, most of the command and control comes from a, a small raspberry pi that's sitting on the drone. So it's my own computer. So it, it, there's, there's no standard for that. Right? And a, a lot of our, our sort of competitors or people in the same space are doing the same thing. They, they build their own computer, they build their own thing, um, to communicate. Right? Because there's, there's still no one drone fit all kind of a solution for uh, for, for basically doing everything. And I think that will be the case for a long time. So moving forward, let's say you have this system, right? And then you have to attach this device to transmit something from your drone. Mm -hmm. And it becomes law, that means all drones must have that. Yes. Then doesn't that kind of uh, create a problem instead of a solution when there's a problem to begin with? You see what my point is? Yeah. 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 That's, uh, that, that, was, that was something we are trying to avoid, right? So we're trying to avoid firstly the hardware. Right? Because that increases the weight for everybody. <laughs> so you have to decrease by time variable. Right. So if you can do it in the software fashion, that's great. Um, you, you, and, it, and because of that, we don't want to go down the path of the ESP. ESP is a dedicated piece, frequency 1090 uh, megahertz. Right. That's different from everything else that we're doing. So if you can go through the same comms channel that we anyway use to control the drone, that will be achieved better. Or the same comms channel that goes to LTE and all these things, it will be much better. So we're trying to find a software solution to, to the Actually, today the man craft world, a hardware problem, right? They, they just buy a box and they still slap it on the plane and they're done. Uh, they fly really far, they have long antennas. It sounds like this is your solution that you haven't <laughs> announced yet, is it? I, I don't know. So I think I, I, I'm actually looking up for ideas, right? So I, and I don't think, I mean, being in Singapore, the, 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 the thing is that we could make it happen maybe at this island, but to actually make it a global standard is, is much more just that to bring it to ICAO, to bring it to basically these guys, right? Um, we, had, we, was, we sat in a forum with ICAO uh, last year, talking about exactly the same thing. And they asked us, what would you propose? And we were like, I don't know. <laughs> so, so we spent a year basically cobbling together some stuff for our own selves. But then, this is trying to see where's the next step. Right? So I'm going to take more time. Thank you very much.